Hello, Professor Nicole Ater. Thank you for joining me today. Um, I should start by introducing myself. My name is Dara Conlon. I'm Executive Vice President of Uretina. Uh, Nicole, you are Professor of Ophthalmology at the University of Munster. Um, second thing I should say to you is Happy International Women's Day. <laughs> yes, same to you. <laughs> <laughs> so perfectly timed for us this week to have a chat about um, something that we have been lobbying hard for over the last year and that you retina both with the president and board have been lobbying hard for. Um, we have done a survey this year. We have investigated many ways to provide supports to female retina specialists. But I might just start by asking you a few questions, please. Um, the first of those is, from your perspective, does the issue of gender inequality persist today? And in your experiences, what are the biggest challenges facing women in the workplace? Yes, there are today there are still large differences in career opportunities, in appreciation of achievements, and in salary between men and women. Although 50% of ophthalmologists are female, only 10% of women are in leadership positions. And um, in, for example, in 2018, there was a survey by the Royal College of Ophthalmology in the United Kingdom, and that showed that 69% of all consultants were men. And if you look into Germany, um, two thirds of medical students here are female, but if we then look at the number of executives in medicine, about 29% only are female, and the percentage of women in leadership positions at a university is even lower. And according to a 2019 um, study by the German medical associations, there are only 8% of women in leadership positions at a university. So it's very much a case of the higher up the ladder you go, the greater an issue this is. Exactly. Yeah. In your view, what can women do to maximize their own and each other's potential for professional success? Mm. And I suppose doing that without sacrificing your own career fulfillment. Yeah, well, for women, the balancing act between work and family is still a lot bigger than for men. Mm -hmm. And issues such as maternity protection and parental leave affect women rather than men. Reconciling career and family is more difficult for women. And for example, maternity protection often leads to an employment prohibition so that the career setback occurs not only after giving birth, but already before. Mm -hmm. And in society, especially in some cultures, the understanding of self-image of um, women and men is still not the same. Yeah, um, I think what we found too is that this can be a very tricky topic for male colleagues as well. Um, one thing that was really interesting and, and uplifting, I think, to see when we circulated the survey was that it was pretty much 50-50 in terms of the response rate between male and female contributors, which was very heartening and really helped us to understand things from both perspectives. So I think as well, one thing that became clear to us in our research is that this can be a difficult topic for, it's a difficult one for male colleagues to navigate. What we also know is that without buy-in from your male colleagues, bosses, management, it's just, it's, it's not gonna fly. Um, I think from the perspective of your retina, we're, we're very lucky that all of the men on the board are very much behind this, this particular crusade, um, starting with Alistair Laidlaw, the president. So it really helps because if we don't have that buy-in, it's just going to be too difficult. In your opinion, or again, from your experience, what are the best um, supports that your male colleagues can do for you? How can they help? Mm. Well, men as uh, colleagues and also as heads of department should be involved in the promotion of women. 
And I think only in this way we will have a real equality of opportunity for work and career in the foreseeable future. And um, but of course, it's it's also up to the women. I mean, it's important for women to think about the compatibility of career and family at an early stage. Um, and in addition to, um, to a plan for clinical training and research, women should also take the advantage of uh, mentorships. Networking is also very important in this context and looking for talent development um, at the um, location you are is also very important in this matter. Nicole, from the survey results that we got, to me, there were two things that stood out in terms of preferred supports that Uretina could provide for its female membership. You touched on mentorship earlier. That was definitely one of them. And actually, that was very popular across both male and female. Um, the other was flexible working hours. How do you think flexible working enables women's career advancement? That's absolutely uh, an issue. Um, I mean, um, adjustable working time models can really reconcile work and, and family life. And so that's very important um, uh, for women, more important for women than, than for men. Um, but also um, looking for special trainings, for example, training for job interviews, skills lab, mentoring programs, as we just said, um, th that special workshops tailored for women might also be an issue. So Nicole, you and I have been working over the past year or more on the Women in Retina panel um, under the steer of Annette Lowenstein. Um, so it started with research and now it's about delivering to see how we can influence at a higher level, some kind of a cultural change. So do you want to give some information on, on what that's entailed? Yes, we've been working together. And uh, I also have to mention Tunde Pedo and Caroline Clava. Uh, both of them are also on this committee. And the retina is committed to support women in ophthalmology that is and was our goal. And uh, so we uh, intended to set up a special um, women in retina program to promote female physicians. And um, so we have annual grants for young retina specialists. We have long-term fellowships for women, promotion of women in the scientific program and mentorships specially tailored for women. Very good. And I think what we've discovered really is that, you know, what happens within various institutions, it's we, we can't really influence that. But by putting the spotlight more on female speakers and, and we, we, we have, you know, good representation of female board members as well, that maybe from that perspective, we can try to create some kind of cultural change. So hopefully institutions, if they aren't already leading the way, might follow if they see European societies trying to implement change. Absolutely. Nicole, that's great. Thank you. Um, so I think it is a case of whilst we've quite a bit done, we have a lot more to do. <laughs> um, and another point to mention is that while we've been doing a lot of work to support women in retina, another very strong priority for the society is to also address ethnic diversity. So yeah, we have we have quite a bit of work ahead, but I feel we're 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 taking steps. Absolutely. And as the retina grows and also the membership grows, um, we should not uh, only look for, for women in, in retina, but also uh, we should look at all cultural aspects um, in retina. Absolutely.